Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Haider Yahya, Marketing Manager of Asino on, in Iraq. On behalf of Asino, I'd like to welcome all of you for our webinar. Uh, our webinar today uh, will be moderated by Assistant Prof. Dr. Manal Nasah. She is the Chief of CME and she's an Assistant Professor at Obstetric and Gynecology Department in University of Kalbala College of Medicine. On behalf of Asino, again, I would like to welcome all our speakers and thank them for their time and effort to make this webinar successful. So, uh, Dr. Manal, the prof, the mic is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hi. Welcome uh, you today and thank you for attending, the, uh, attending this webinar in the light of the current pandemic and uh, hope you and your families are all safe. Uh, today I will be the moderator of uh, this webinar. This webinar will be in two days and this is about uh, recent progress in gynecology and reproductive medicine. Uh, the uh, webinar will be, uh, today, today will, we have uh, two lectures. Uh, the first lecture is for uh, for Dr. Uh, Prof. Rahim uh, Haloub, which is about safe and effective induction of ovulation in IVF. Uh, Dr. Rahim Haloub, which is, is a well-known uh, FRCOG consultant of obstetric and gynecology in Basil, uh, Basil University of Hospital in UK. The second lecture is, will be about uh, rule of costing in IVF. Uh, uh, presented by Prof. Basim Shamfri, uh, consultant of obstetric and gynecology in University of Kufa, College of Medicine. Tomorrow we will have also uh, two lectures. Uh, the first lecture, uh, which is about IVF protocols, the full story, uh, uh, presented by uh, Prof. Ali Naqash, uh, MDCHB, FRCOG, and uh, Prof. consultant of obstetric and gynecology, fertility specialist, uh, uh, University. Uh, Hospital from London also. And the second lecture uh, will be presented by me, which is about poor uh, responder in IVF. Uh, okay, uh, now uh, the first lecture will be uh, uh, will be presented by Dr. Rahim Haloub uh, uh, about uh, the safe and effective induction of uh, ovulation in IVF. Welcome, Dr. Rahim. Oh, yeah. Dr. Ah, sorry. The, uh, we have a welcome it's speech really first. <laughs> welcome speech by our dean, uh, Prof. Dr. Riyad Zubaydi. Dr. Riyad Zubaydi, uh, the mic is for yours. Shukran jazeean. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa al baytihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahiri. Azai, Sadatna al-Kabir, Dr. Rahim, Sadatna al-Kabir, Dr. Basma, Sadatna al-Dr. Manal, Sadatna al-Shallah, Bagadan, Dr. Ali Naqash, Nrahim bikum, Ajmal Tarheem. واحنا في منتهى السرور والعرفان للجهود الكبيرة تبذلونها سيما أستاذنا الكبير دكتور الرحيم فالورش مالته يعني الدروس التعليمية اللي يعطيها في كربلاء وبالنجاح وبالبصرة يعني يعني دال على عظيم الجهد الذي يبذله فاحنا عاجزين عن شكرك أستاذنا الكبير دكتور الرحيم شكرا على دكتور يا ضالك شكرا تكبر شكرا بالشهر أنا رحب بكم جميعا سادة الأسادة المحاضرين وسادة الحضور باسم السيد رئيس الجامعة السادة الدكتور باسم سعيدي رئيس جامعة كربلاء وأنا هسا حضوري أنا هسه العميدة ساني نخليها أنا حاضر هسا بصفتي تلميذ لكم أساتذتي أنا أتعلم لما معي عيسان يقول مغبون من تساوى يوما أنا أطمح لأن بعد هذا الاستماع لكم أساتذتي أنا أكون تعلمت أمور حقا لربما تخطر في بال وانتم اساتذتي اكو تطورات كبيره بتكنولوجيا الخلايا الجرعيه التلاعب بالاجنه نماذج الانسجه والخلايا التناسليه اكثر يعني زرع الانسجه خلايا الغدد بالمختبر او بجسم الانسان انتم اعرف ما عندي اكثر بس لربما يخطر ببالي تساؤل يعني هل اكو حد او عمر معين للنساء نقولها يا بت الناس الاتباع الطريق الطبيعي للانجاب ما يفيد ابدا مبكر باعتبار ان تقدم العمر هم يحمل مخاطر للمراه الحامل بهذا النمط هذه وحدة وهل أكو تحديدات على المرضى المصابين أو النساء المصابات بكورونا أنه بدخالهم في هذا النمط من من عمليات الإخصاب وأنا أشكركم جدا أساتذتي ويعني ولي الشرف أنا أكرر هذه الشرف أنا أكون تلميذ لكم والله يوفقكم على بركة الله نبدأ شكرا 
شكرا جزيلا دكتور رياض وان شاء الله اسئلتك ان شاء الله كلها نجاوبها اليوم شكرا جزيلا لحضرتك دكتور راح يندم مايكل جوز دكتور امانه ثانك يو فيري ماتش دكتور رياض اوف كورس ثانك يو حيدر فور ذا جريت جوب يو ار اكشلي هيلبينج اس اول ذا تايم وذ اور ويبينار اند ام فيري جريت فور تو يو حيدر اند يور تيم ان اثينا My lecture is today with regard to the um, the protocol of induction of ovulation and how can we actually be safe when we uh, administer a protocol to our patients. And I'm trying to show you my presentation in a minute. Can you can you see that one clearly? I still cannot see it. Hi, Dr. Kari, can you see it? No, Doctor. Try again. I will try again. What about now, Haider? No? No. Yes. Any luck? Yes, yes. It's loading. Yeah, just give it a full screen and go ahead. Go. Yes. Okay. All fine. Is it clear now? Oh, that's good. Thank you very much. Now, my, my talk will be uh, three parts. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about different protocol of induction of ovulation, that's number one, followed by how to improve the outcome of induction of ovulation in terms of uh, benefit to our patient. And number three, whether if we use adjuvant medication to enhance the induction of ovulation protocol will benefit the outcome. Now, uh, all, we, we all know that uh, induction of many protocol um, uh, for IVF induction of ovulation or control hyperstimulation hyper for IVF has been there for a long time. But we, we know for sure that there's no one treatment scheme that works for each woman. Uh, very variable outcome. Uh, some of the patients might develop only very few eggs, which is a poor responder. Some of them actually develop the right uh, number of eggs. People actually talking about maybe 10 to 15 eggs, the ideal. And other might, might hyperstimulate, would, uh, which lead to uh, complication like uh, ovulation. And uh, Professor uh, Basma will actually talk about that. And of course, uh, remember that that could be very serious and might lead to death of the patient and recorded few deaths. Uh, from hyperstimulation. So therefore, we have to be vigilant. Now, uh, both of ovulation induction protocol use three groups of medication. And I'm going to go through these three groups in order to organize ourselves to look at all of them. The first group include the gonadotrophine, clomiphene, straight, and letrozole, which are used to stimulate development of ovarian follicle. The idea is just to bring the follicle from prophase uh, one to metaphase uh, uh, one and then on with it to develop into metaphase uh, uh, two. And then of course it will lead to, uh, and uh, um, L hormone and use for triggering ovulation at the end of follicular development. And the third group is the adjuvant medication. Adjuvant medication, um, the GnRH analog and the antagonist and the other medications such as promocryptin, oral contraception, progesterone, DHEA, growth hormone, aspirin, all these are adjuvant medication. Now, oh, with regard to, to the GnRH analog uh, and um, uh, before that, the clomiphene to inhibit the or compete with the with the with the estrogen receptor and develop more of, of other drug uh, gave us uh, multiple options 
maybe a combination of, of medication might actually result in a better outcome in terms of induction of ovulation. And uh, people are actually talking about the GNR analog uh, protocol uh, uh, when we use the gonadotrophin only, or maybe using combination of uh, clom clomiphene and gonadotrophin, and uh, co other combination uh, therapy, including the recombinant FSH and even recombinant LH, which is not actually widely used. But in general term, we are actually talking about three protocols the GNRH uh, uh, agonist and the other protocol GR, uh, GNR, GNRH antagonist and a third protocol, which is called minimal stimulation protocol, utilizing minimal uh, gonadotrophin and in addition to the uh, usage of the clomiphene, uh, and that result. But which one of these? Very hard to tell. So therefore we have to introduce the criteria for IVF protocol selection. But even with the criteria, which I'm going to talk uh, about it later on, even the criteria, it's actually up to the clinician to decide which protocol should be ideal for that particular patient because there are many variables. And we have to um, we have to take into consideration the benefits and the shortcoming of each treatment option for the patient, and of course how the patient respond to that particular uh, protocol. But in general, whatever protocol we are going to use, we are actually going to have either a high response from that protocol or maybe intermediate response or poor response. And then that will then influence our decision for the future if the patient did not actually get a pregnant first treatment cycle. Therefore, the first treatment cycle of the IVF is very important and we have to be very careful and the evaluation of the patient is very important. How do we evaluate the patient? We evaluate the patient from the current investigation like the level of the effort or maybe previous outcome, like how many eggs she produced before and whether she had cycle cancellation and how, many, how much gonadotrophin she had. And of course, the level of uh, E2 uh, used for uh, uh, criteria, especially for uh, poor ovarian response. Now, there is a group of, of people between between 9 to 24 percent of all IVF patients. We call them, we label them as poor responder based on uh, either evalu our evaluation by employing uh, like a, a, a clinical uh, test like the uh, uh, clomiphene challenge test, like uh, GNRH agonist uh, test, like the end uh, or uh, uh, laboratory test like the anti malaria and, and uh, uh, or ultrasound uh, evaluation of the antral follicle count. Even, even if we employ that one, it might be very hard, very difficult to identify this group of people. But uh, some people uh, like uh, uh, Malmozzi, that's Italian, uh, uh, say that patient with low number of oocyte taking from the previous IVF uh, or outcome of IVF treatment, if she had less than four, uh, will be labeled a poor responder. Or if the level of the FSH greater than 30 uh, international unit, of course, 30 international unit put her in the, uh, in the uh, um, uh, definition of the maybe premature menopause. Now, uh, we, we know the effect of the advanced maternal age on the, on the production of the, uh, of the follicle and uh, poor ovarian reserve. But what about the young patient? Sometimes young patients might actually have poor uh, uh, ovarian reserve, but the, the etiology of that is very uh, vague and very unknown. Now, coming to the big picture, from Ashri. Ashri believe that, that the European uh, Society of Embryology and Fertility, Ashri believe that the only uh, thing we can actually employ in order to detect type of patient we have is the antrophollicle count and antimalarian hormone level. And uh, 
that and they don't actually recommend any other test to to evaluate that and that i will i will show it to you later on that their recommendation is a bit different there are about nearly 80 recommendations from the from Poor uh, or or uh, maybe possibly recommended and uh, uh, but not approved by the uh, by the ASHRAE. Now, um, uh, so we we know that we have we have three protocol and um, uh, and uh, we have the the third protocol, the minimal simulation protocol. The advantage of 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 uh, having these different protocol because every one of a uh, protocol different from the others. The minimal stimulation protocol, shorter duration of treatment and less gonadotrophy. So therefore, financially it's cheaper for the patient. However, we need to look at the outcome of that later on. Now the GNRH agonist uh, uh, long protocol is better for follicular growth and the outcome of that is better pregnancy rate but it costs a lot of money and it is a lengthy procedure of induction of ovulation. On the other hand, a patient with poor ovarian rhythm may have a greater advantage when they, you, we employ minimal stimulation protocol. Uh, in this case, better actually for the patient because it can be repeated uh, many times. But Although we are actually talking about this protocol very easily and very, very uh, uh, common knowledge, but there are variable which might actually modify this uh, uh, protocol, like age of the patient, like BMI, like the polycystic ovary, like a previous IVF outcome. And in order to reach more definitive conclusion from that, we have to look at these variable and the effect of this variable on the outcome of the IVF or individual protocol. If we are taking the, the, the high uh, BMI, the, uh, of course, the duration of the stimulation with the high BMI, it's actually longer, so the prolonged stimulation. And um, due to the high BMI, there's a reduction in the pregnancy rate. Now, if we combine both the high BMI and the polycystic ovary, we have even a higher dose of the of uh, of uh, gonadotrophin. And if you were, if you compare like uh, a normal BMI with the uh, with the BMI below thirty and uh, uh, above thirty, you will find that the gonadotrophin injection about fifty percent more. In the normal, uh, in the high BMI, comparing to the normal BMI, um, uh, we are talking about 3,000 international units comparing to 1,800 international units. And in addition to that, you will find that the miscarriage rate is very high in 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 case of uh, patients who require gonadotrophin. Uh, uh, the pregnancy rate will be lower also. Therefore, these things can be utilized to actually counsel the patient and tell them that, well, look, basically we have to consider that. And if there's a question about, about reduction in the, uh, in the weight, we have to uh, consider that until the patient reach uh, BMI near to 30. If you look at the issue of the... <laughs> Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Shall we? Sh shall we continue? Okay. Yeah. Fine. Well, what what I actually say that with regard to the uh, the uh, comparison between the uh, normal weight patient and obese patient, the outcome of induction of ovulation and of course the uh, the requirement for gonadotrophin is actually very clear from this picture. Just looking at it, you find that patient with normal weight will have a huge benefit of induction of ovulation with minimal gonadotrophin. Uh, comparing to uh, the um, uh, obese patient. Now, um, the uh, of course, there, there is another uh, variable contribute to the induction of ovulation outcome, 
which is the LHF and such ratio in patients with polycystic ovary treated by uh, uh, ART. And of course, the higher value of the uh, ratio or the higher um, LH level will, will actually mean requirement for the gonadotropin uh, or the HMG uh, and uh, more than the patient with the, with the normal LHF and such ratio. And the study here, prospective study comparing HMG alone uh, with, uh, with uh, HMG uh, with the longer protocol, again, uh, indicated that longer protocol will be longer and the requirement for the gonadotropin will be higher. Now, um, uh, there, there is one study actually published by the Robinson et al. Uh, favored the agonist protocol, that means longer protocol, in patients with the normal body weight uh, or normal BMI, and, uh, and showed no difference between the efficacy of the uh, uh, two protocol, whether it's agonist or antagonist protocol, if the patient have uh, her BMI above 40. So therefore, uh, the, the BMI is a very important factor with or without polycystic ovary. Now, the, uh, the effects, again, the, uh, uh, the effect of the uh, uh, induction of the ovulation protocol and requirement for gonadotropin uh, will be reflected on not only on the pregnancy rate, but on the miscarriage rate. And if you look at the uh, holistic ovary, which indicate that the, the longer protocol and requirement for the gonadotropin higher in that group, comparing to the, uh, the control group, and you will find from different study about four study published, find that the miscarriage rate is higher in the group with, with high BMI and polycystic ovary and high requirement for the uh, gonadotropin. Now, um, the, uh, the French uh, um, uh, published a very interesting study looking at not only the, uh, how many follicles we produce, and, but the quality the quality of the follicular development. And they found that injection of the GnRH antagonist, three milligrams, uh, two or three days before the uh, um, menstruation and or before the treatment cycle in patient undergoing control of various stimulation, improved the, what we call it, the homogeneity, the homogeneity of the cohort of the developing follicle. Meaning that if we are looking at the cohort of the follicle at the beginning, of induction of ovulation, we want them to grow together. And if they grow together, it means that the probability of mature follicle to be collected later on, uh, egg to be collected, might be better than the, the, uh, the, uh, the one without actually, uh, according to their study, without uh, giving the uh, GnRH antagonist the, uh, two to three days before the period. And the authors concluded that the, um, uh, in order to improve the homogeneity uh, um, uh, in the size and development of the follicle, it would improve the IVF outcome by increasing the number of mature follicle, according to them. Now, effectiveness of the minimal stimulation protocol. Now, the minimal stimulation protocol, remember that you can use it for the, for, um, majority of the poor responder. The, uh, and we, we have to look at the contribution of the clomiphene uh, in terms of uh, production of the, of the mature follicle and uh, the uh, improvement of the outcome of induction of population. Of course, the clomiphene suppresses the premature uh, LH. Uh, and, and maintaining the, uh, the influence on the follicular development. And uh, uh, in, in the case of the minimal uh, simulation, the fewer gonadotropin ampoule, the number of gonadotropin ampoule used in the protocol uh, significantly lower. So if we compare the amount and number of ampoule we use uh, for minimal stimulation with the clomiphene or letrozole, it's 5.7 comparing to 25 in the longer protocol. However, the, the protocol had result in less mature uh, 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 follicle and lower chance of obtaining viable frozen embryo for future pregnancy. Uh, 
However, if we compare the pregnancy rate and implantation rate uh, uh, um, uh, in, in different uh, uh, um, protocol, compare it with the minimal protocol, we find that the outcome of the implantation and the pregnancy is similar with the agonist protocol. That means uh, uh, similar to the uh, uh, long pro GNRS long protocol. So therefore, it's very cost effective, and not only that, but it has a very low risk of development of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Right. Now, how can we actually conduct that, that protocol? Conduction of a protocol, I will, I will show you a picture of uh, gonadotrophin. The, the, we start you the, the six or five and continue the treatment with gonadotrophin after the uh, five, uh, five days until the day of the uh, HCG or, or uh, LH uh, search. And um, that, that actually, if you look at this protocol of uh, uh, stimulation, uh, uh, clomiphene in conjunction with the human menopausal gonadotrophin HMG is more effective comparing to uh, um, uh, HMG alone. So the if we if we look at the pregnancy rate, um, uh, it's about forty six comparing to twenty five point five. So there is advantage of cost and advantage of outcome. Now, uh, what about letrozole? Can we actually use the letrozole induction of ovulation protocol for IVF? Yes, uh, the advantage of the letrozole is maintaining the endometrial thickness, we know that, and it, uh, it, it does not hamper the negative feedback mechanism of hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis and allow monofollicular growth uh, and decrease the chance of multiple pregnancy and of course hyperstimulation when you combine it with the, with the and the trophy. And, uh, and there is a big advantage using lotrisol for an inpatient with the with polystic ovary uh, comparing to the clomiphene. Now, there are things about the uh, letrozole, although letrozole is encouraged by the ASHRI, but the use of a drug has been associated with congenital anomalies in animal study and has not been approved for use of uh, uh, induction of ovulation. And the NICE guideline actually mentioned it, but they did not recommend it. Now, ASHRI wanted to put the idea into a fixed protocol for everyone and therefore can be utilized very easily. So they put it in different group, three group, low to responder, normal responder, and high responder. And everything in, in, in green is actually recommended and first choice and everything in red is the second choice. That means you could actually choose the red one for your patient, but depending on many criteria. And this low and uh, normal and high responder, depending on the prediction of the ovarian response by AMH and antral follicle count only. AMH and antral follicle count. So accordingly, a patient with low responder uh, or classifier low responder, you can actually utilize the antagonist protocol or agonist protocol and the gonadotropin used 150 to 300 international unit and uh, the normal responder, the recommendation is the antagonist protocol and uh, over the agonist protocol and the amount 150 uh, to 225 gonadotropin. Well, high responder, the antagonist protocol recommended with the gonadotropin 150 international unit comparing to the, uh, the, um, the uh, long protocol. When it comes to the, the uh, uh, triggering, the low responder will be triggered like before, like before with uh, 10,000 units. And of course the, the luteal phase support uh, vaginally and orally or, or intramuscular and oral. While in the normal responder, 
the again the triggering will be 10,000 HDG or recombinant 250 microgram and the natural Gonads rather than HCG or recombinant HCG, with the view that we have we are going to freeze all of them. Now, uh, the uh, in this group, cancellation uh, uh, of the cycle uh, is sometimes recommended in order to avoid the major complication uh, for the patients, like the hyperstimulation. While in the low response, the cancellation. Uh, it's due to the fact that either there is one follicle or maybe no follicles uh, uh, or no no uh, egg uh, uh, retrieved, so therefore cancellation is recommended. That's the ashray. There's another group of of uh, of authority. Uh, to make it very simple that we have three protocol: minimal stimulation, agonist protocol, and uh, uh, antagonist protocol, and agonist protocol. The minimal stimulation start with the day two gonadotropin and day day five or six combined gonadotropin with clomiphene 100 milligrams, and then continue until the day of the ICG injection. While the antagonist protocol, uh, uh, the gonadotropin on day two, and then and then gonadotropin and the antagonist from from day seven, or according to uh, to the ultrasound finding, that when the mature follicle uh, uh, more than fourteen millimeter, then you give uh, uh, um, antagonist in order to control the LH search. While the longer protocol is long, either you start on day uh, 21 or day one. And day 21, of course, the, uh, the GNRH analog, either daily injection or, or a monthly injection, one injection will cover all uh, throughout the protocol and, uh, uh, and start the induction of ovulation with gonadotropin on day two of the of the uh, of the uh, uh, period or when when you think that there is a, a sufficient evidence of down regulation finished you give the trigger injection which will be either recombinant or hcg uh, injection and then you collect the egg uh, after 36 uh, hours now so therefore, in, in conclusion from that, that the, the poor responder do very best and with, uh, with the mild stimulation, while if in the normal uh, population or the majority of our patients have the advantage of providing embryo for future uh, uh, transfer by uh, um, uh, adopting the uh, uh, long protocol or uh, antagonist protocol, Mild stimulation uh, can be can be utilized for normal responder, especially if you don't have uh, a service for cryopreservation. While in the normal responder above, uh, utilizing the agonist or antagonist protocol, it, the advantage of that you will actually produce more follicle and more embryos. Therefore, for future uh, for future pregnancy after a cryopreservation. With regard to the hyper responder, you can actually, uh, the aim of the uh, induction of ovulation protocol to prevent ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And therefore, you have to think about mild stimulation by looking at the amount of the, of the gonadotropin uh, 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 daily injection. And if you have a high, uh, um, uh, ratio of LHFSH ratio for stimulation, that means you have to use a higher uh, gonadotropin, but you have to be very careful with regard to the, uh, uh, to the hyperstimulation. Now, with regard to the NICE guideline, NICE guideline in 2012 recommend down regulation in, uh, in gonadotropin stimulation. That's a very, uh, very good recommendation, of course, adopted. 
and uh, either they use the gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist uh, down regulation or or uh, or uh, antagonist down regulation but one recommendation with regard to uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist to women who have a low risk of uh, of ovarian hyperstimulation if they are high responder now that means you have to you have to be very careful even with the recommendation that a uh, patient should be allocated for uh, appropriate induction of ovulation program, depending on their response. Now, when you compare the antagonist and the agonist down regulation protocol, uh, there are significant difference between them. The, the, uh, the uh, um, agonist protocol is a long protocol uh, comparing to the uh, antagonist. And of course, the risk of hyperstimulation more in the in the agonist comparing to antagonist. There is no difference in terms of uh, a full term <clears throat> life birth, miscarriage rate, and multiple pregnancy rate. This is very important. And the other uh, other difference, there is no evidence of any difference. Now, the GnRH agonist protocol, uh, um, the, even in that protocol, there is variable variable number one, variable number two, and sometimes even variable number three. Uh, the longer protocol uh, start on day 21 and followed by gonadotropin on day three, or longer protocol start on day one and simulation start when down regulation confirmed, achieved, usually by either checking, uh, checking the LH or E2 level. And, uh, uh, and uh, even the third one, uh, there is uh, uh, a third protocol when you, when you start the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the down regulation at any time during the cycle, which we will come to it later on. Now, uh, if we compare the pregnancy rate with the, from, uh, between the antagonist and the, and, uh, and the agonist protocol, they clearly that this advantage of the longer protocol over the uh, the uh, antagonist protocol in terms of a pregnancy rate. There's a marginal difference between the two uh, in, <clears throat> in different study. Again, if we look at many study again, you will find that the edge <clears throat> of the uh, longer protocol is better than the, the antagonist protocol. Uh, um, uh, it's very clearly in different study uh, um, uh, mentioned here. Now, uh, gonadotrophy requirement now. The gonadotrophy requirement is very important here. The higher gonadotrophy requirement, as I mentioned before, it will reduce clinical pregnancy rate and, and life birth rate. And, uh, and, um, and of course, it might actually indicate that probably ovarian reserve is actually reduced. And uh, of course, there is no role in minimal stimulation protocol here because um, it might be, but the failure rate and cancellation rate is very high. Now, we come back to the ASHRAE recommendation. And I, I, I'm very keen to tell you about the ASHRAE recommendation because there are many recommendations and I want to go very frequent, very, very uh, quickly through that one. If you look at the um, <clears throat> GnRH antagonist uh, uh, protocol, it's recommended for women with polycystic ovary. That, uh, that's the antagonist protocol. Uh, that's the recommendation from the ASHRAE. And the GnRH antagonist protocol recommended for prediction of high responder also. Uh, um, and um, uh, because of the suppression, and uh, the clomiphene citrate to uh, combination with the gonadotropin uh, and stimulation protocol is not recommended by ASHRAE, but recommended for minimal stimulation. So ASHRAE don't recommend the combination of clomiphene and gonadotropin. There's insufficient uh, evidence of recommendation to add letrozole. Again, that's not actually very clear. And, uh, and uh, with regard to uh, recommendation of the uh, uh, GnRH antagonist protocol, it's recommended for prediction of high responder. However, in the GnRH antagonist <clears throat> protocol, are, are reduced to to reduce the gonadotropin in dose. Probably it's, uh, it's uh, recommended, though probably they are not sure about it. 
So therefore, there is no evidence to justify the use of natural cycle or modified natural cycle for ovarian stimulation in a predicted high responder. Now, with the normal, normal responder, the GNRH antagonist protocol recommended, while letrozole uh, combination with gonadotropin probably not recommended, <coughs> and reduced gonadotropin probably not recommended over conventional gonadotropin dose for prediction of normal responder. And there is no evidence to recommend the use of clomiphene and st uh, stimulation protocol for predicted normal responder. That's a normal responder. Now, poor responder, uh, that, um, that's a bit, a bit tricky. The GNRH antagonist and GR uh, agonist is equally recommended for uh, predicted uh, poor responder, according to the ASHRI. And uh, uh, and clomiphene, uh, uh, clomiphene uh, uh, citrate or combination of, with the gonadotropin is equally recommended for predicted poor responder. And uh, in addition to that, letrozole is probably not recommended for predicted poor responder, although people actually recommended letrozole and clomiphene anyway, clearly. And it's unclear uh, uh, whether high, uh, high, high dose of gonadotropy is recommended over 150 international units for a predicted poor responder to improve the outcome. <clears throat> it's not clear. Gonadotropy dose higher than 300 international units is not recommended for a predicted poor responder. A lot of people actually give 450 in order to produce more follicle, but according to the ASHRI, it's not recommended because you actually compromise the quality of the eggs. <clears throat> the use of the modified natural cycle is probably not recommended over conventional ovarian stimulation for predicted poor responder. These are recommendations. What about the suppression of the regime, uh, 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 the LH uh, uh, suppression regime, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which one is preferred? The GNRH agonists are used uh, the, the long GNRH agonist protocol is probably recommended over the short or ultra short. So the, the GNRH protocol, uh, the normal GNRH long protocol is recommended over the ultra short and the, the, uh, uh, um, the short protocol, which is not recommended by the ASHRI. The uh, GNRH antagonist uh, protocol is recommended over the GNRH agonist protocol is given. And, uh, um, and the, um, the, uh, the use of a progestine, sometimes progesterone given to suppress the LH peak is not recommended according to the ASHRAE. <clears throat> it's a bit complicated, but I just want to go through it very, very quickly. And, um, now, uh, there, there are other recommendations with regard to the injection, which gonadotropin we should give in order to achieve better uh, follicular growth and better quality uh, follicle. Um, <clears throat> the, um, they they mention about the HMG and the recombinant FSH, equally recommended, no difference. And uh, there, there is no difference between the recombin uh, recombinant FSH and the purified uh, uh, purified, uh, uh, high purified FSH, there is no uh, difference, uh, equally recommended. And equally recommended is the uh, uh, recombinant FSH and highly purified FSH. And equally recommended between the high purified FSH and the HMG. <clears throat> and the use of the LH, uh, 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 recombinant LH and recombinant FSH for ovarian stimulation, probably not recommended, or maybe we don't actually have sufficient uh, criteria for that. And uh, um, according to Ashri, again, let's is not recommended. To replace the gonadotropin in poor responder. Well, which is available now, uh, one injection for, uh, for per week, <clears throat> and according to this, it's equal.
Now, what about, what about the pre-treatment uh, uh, and uh, other supplement? We are going to talk about that uh, from the Ashley point of view. <clears throat> and uh, they, they, they lifted a few of the uh, Ashri before and uh, during ovarian stimulation with the, with the GNRH antagonist protocol for women with polycystic ovary. And uh, the growth hormone also probably not recommended. The androgen supplement probably not recommended and uh, DHEA according to the ASHRI also not recommended and but probably not recommended that means they are not sure about it aspirin is not recommended according to them uh, uh, for especially for poor responder because people actually give uh, uh, um, aspirin in order to improve the uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, blood flow and therefore improve the endometrial thickness the uh, uh, viagra Viagra, you you use very widely in Europe, and according to the ASHRI, it's not recommended for poor responder. And there was there there is no evidence uh, control study or randomized control study addressing the efficacy and safety of adjuvant endomethacine. The endomethacine sometimes people actually give endomethacine during ovarian stimulation. I'm not sure uh, what the effect of that and and the action, but this is not recommended by the ASHRI. So what is the preferred uh, fertility preservation? If you have a patient wanted to preserve her fertility because she is not planning to get pregnant, uh, GNRH antagonist is recommended for her. But if you, if you look at the oncology patient, the oncology patient, there is a random start ovarian stimulation. Random start for ovarian stimulation because you should not waste time. And therefore you have to start her at any time during her cycle. And that actually, you can follow the Chinese method, either by <clears throat> uh, one uh, egg collection or double egg collection uh, protocol. It is a, a, um, a double uh, egg collection protocol utilized in order to produce more uh, follicle and more eggs for uh, the future uh, um, uh, cryopreservation for oncology patients. <clears throat> The triggering, the triggering is very important here because triggering will achieve final maturation of the follicle before a collection. And the triggering can be achieved with either uh, uh, recombinant HCG or urinary HCG and or, or uh, alternatively GNRH uh, um, analog uh, uh, 0.1 to 0.4 uh, micro, uh, milligram in order to uh, induce final maturation. <clears throat> but uh, actually don't actually recommend what we call a dual trigger. Dual trigger meaning that combination of GNRH uh, agonist in addition to HCG, people actually give in order to improve the final maturation, but that's not actually recommended by ASHRI. Now, therefore, uh, therefore, uh, the uh, the available evidence from previous published literature regarding the efficacy of different IVF protocol, uh, GNRH agonist long protocol and antagonist protocol and minimal stimulation. These are now standard protocol, and every one of them <coughs> is different from the other in terms of uh, cause and outcome. Now we'll leave that aside. And we we uh, we go we go to the uh, should LH be added to the FSH in simulation protocol? What is the value of adding adding LH? Of course, the the uh, if we look at the uh, hello ten minutes. Okay, okay. In terms of the early follicular phase, uh, uh, it's characterized by the LH receptor, uh, which is actually in theca cell. And of course, the FSH receptor on granular cell. Now, the uh, uh, and in, uh, at the beginning of the of the proliferative phase, we have a prevalence of the FSH activity. <clears throat> the middle and late follicular phase is characterized by the presence of the LH receptor on both theca and granular cell, with the prevalence of LH activity. Therefore, from that 
you will find that you will actually, uh, uh, you will need less uh, LIH at the beginning of the induction of ovulation. Uh, induction of ovulation, and therefore people might actually have uh, like a combination of LH uh, uh, with the FSNH later in the cycle, but there is no evidence that the LH will be needed. And uh, there are many study conflicting outcome uh, um, indicating that combination of LH and FSNH better than the uh, recombinant FSNH alone. But uh, uh, there are other studies showing that pregnancy rate with the uh, uh, combination of LH and FSH better than the recombinant FSH. Now, can we identify the patient requiring LH? Um, it will be apart from checking the uh, uh, measuring the LH level after down regulation. Um, <clears throat> to find out whether you are you are you are controlling the L the LH completely uh, 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 or not. So uh, if if you have if you have uh, any indication to add LH, but this is actually not very uh, clear uh, um, uh, uh, recommendation that uh, we need to do that in order to find out whether we should give LH. Uh, or not, this is actually personal reference, uh, preference. Now, uh, uh, with regard to the FSH and the HMG, there are five uh, uh, um, control trial inv involving 2,000 women and uh, um, with the clinical pregnancy higher with the HMG comparing to the FSH I mentioned before, and there is no difference in the live birth, which is the ultimate uh, outcome. Again, there are other studies showing that uh, the, comparing the FSH and the HMG, and they found that higher birth rate uh, with the HMG, and another 42 uh, uh, randomized control trial involving a huge number of patients. Hello? Huge number of patients in the, in the uh, uh, birth rate. Growth hormone is not recommended uh, uh, and uh, it's poorly actually uh, uh, researched and therefore uh, there are personal choice with regard to whether growth hormone will be needed for to uh, prime the IVF uh, treatment cycle. DHEA, the same thing, although the DHEA is different. The DHEA, uh, um, uh, it will actually be, um, uh, you have to uh, give the DHEA about three to four months before the IVF treatment. And therefore, from our study, uh, uh, show that the follicular growth better, the number of follicle produced better, higher, the number of egg retrieved higher, and the number of embryo uh, produced higher, number of embryo reaching day five, uh, when the uh, the IVF treatment cycle primed by the DHEA is higher. So therefore, for my practice, I actually utilize the uh, um, DHEA in a poor responder in order to improve the quality of the of the uh, of the uh, egg retrieved. Low dose aspirin, there is no difference in whether you are using it or not, and metformin. Uh, apart from a uh, 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 few studies showed that there is a recommendation when in a patient with the polycystic ovary, but there's significant lower uh, um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. I'm sure Basma will actually talk about the recommendation of the uh, utilizing metformin to prevent uh, the uh, um, uh, hyperstimulation syndrome. The dose I give long acting one rather than the regular one, I give 1000 milligram at night, one dose only. <clears throat> and how about oral contraception prior to the IVF treatment? The oral contraception for a month to downregulate prior to the IVF treatment decrease the incidence of the uh, uh, formation. Uh, they mentioned that creates a, a larger number of the uh, of oocyte and uh, higher E2 level, and uh, uh, the stimulation protocol is shorter than the than the uh, uh, people treated without priming the IVF uh, cycle with the oral contraception and higher fertilization rate. 
and of course the uh, the uh, giving estrogen prior to the uh, stimulation very clearly that there is uh, there is no evidence from the uh, many studies uh, other adjuvant not very clear about it and uh, triggering of course i mentioned triggering very important triggering either by hcg or uh, recombinant lh or uh, case 15 which is for research only and um, but there is no significant difference in number of egg or embryo or, or, or in fertilization rates. But there is another uh, study from Japan utilizing nasal administration of single dose of GnRH agonist uh, during stimulation for triggering. That's very interesting one. Uh, and in conclusion, in conclusion, the short uh, uh, GnRH antagonist protocol should be the protocol of choice for patients undergoing their first uh, IRT cycle in female below the age of 40, uh, or uh, sorry, below the age of 40, uh, including both low and high responder. When uh, an age dependent initially fixed gonadotropin dose is used, as an increased risk of uh, severe hyperstimulation associated with complication is seen in long GnRH uh, uh, agonist protocol. Patients at risk of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation particularly benefit from short GnRH antagonist treatment as, uh, uh, comparing to uh, um, uh, other protocol and utilizing the uh, agonist for triggering. And poor responder, of course, uh, best treat by mild hyper mild stimulation protocol, as I mentioned before, and I'm not going to repeat that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Dr. Brahim Halu. And I think we will leave the question uh, in the end of the uh, lectures. Uh, now we will be with Dr. Basime to present her. Basime, Dr. Basime Kapaji. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Okay, shukran jazeelan, Dr. Manan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. To start with, I want to thank. Tismaoni. Sot wadah, Ustada. Uh, I want, uh, in fact, I want to thank uh, the Medical College, University of Karbala, for their inviting me to be uh, to be with the, with the, with them today, uh, especially Dr. Riyadh and Dr. Amanal. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the Asinod company for their hard job, in fact, uh, for their communication and everything. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Prof. Rahim Halu for his very interesting and uh, excellent uh, um, topic. Uh, shall I share my? Okay. So my subject today is the role of costing in IVF. To start with, I think we should talk shortly about the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Uh, as you all know, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome affect and uh, affect young and healthy women who find themselves in a serious, grave, atherogenic, and sometimes life-threatening problem. As Prof. Rahim Halub said, it's life threatening. It may affect the life of the mother. The, might, the life of the mother might be uh, lost because of this problem. And this is simply why, because they want to be pregnant. They want to have a baby. So this is a very, a very grave problem. And it is iatrogenic, iad which is secondary to medication. And it is considered the second, uh, second in, in the list to the multiple pregnancy as an adverse outcome that need to be minimized or completely uh, uh, eliminated if we can. 
And the medication used, as we know, is the clomiphene citrate, uh, which was introduced in 1960, gonadotrophin therapy introduced in 1970, and gonadotrophin releasing hormone uh, agonist uh, introduced in 1980, and antagonist analog introduced in 1990. And it was a reported incidence of moderate to severe OHSS ranges from 0.6 to 5% of, uh, in, uh, of in vitro fertilization cycle. And some reported even, uh, actually report even uh, it reached up to 9% of the IVF cycle. So what about the pathogenesis of ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome? The exact pathogenesis of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is unknown. But there is a, a, a many studies and everything known to be dependent on the SCG. The pathophysiology may be de mainly dependent on the uh, human chorionic gonadotrophin, whether exogenous human chorionic gonadotrophin or endogenous human chorionic gonadotrophin. As OHSS does not occur if human chorionic gonadotrophin is withheld, and ongoing SCG stimulation by early pregnancy as a pregnancy proceeded is a significant risk factor for persistent and severe OHSS. This high, high uh, human chorionic gonadotropin dependence underlies some of the major preventive strategies for the, for the syndrome. As we all, uh, as we see here that exogenous human chorionic gonadotropin or endogenous human chorionic, affecting the follicle, uh, follicular, uh, follicle, uh, uh, the follicle and the ovary and stimulate the follicle to produce the vascular endothelial growth factor, which in turn increase the permea vascular permeability and loss of the fluid to the third space. In terms of the onset, we may divide the, uh, the um, uh, uh, OHSS into early OHSS and late OHSS. Early uh, OHSS is due to exogenous uh, SCG and late OHSS is, the, is related to endogenous OH, uh, SCG, which is produced by the ongoing pregnancy. What happened here is the, uh, the, is the uh, stimulation of the follicle to release numerous vasoactive substances implicated in the pathophysiology of the disease. And this include proranin, renin, prostaglandin, angiotensin 2, vascular endothelial growth factor, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, insulin growth factor 1, epidermal growth factor, basic fibroblast growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, transforming growth factor alpha and beta, and interleukin 1, beta 2, and, and 6. Many of these substances are pro-angiogenic and are probably responsible for the physiologic neovascularization that occur during folliculogenesis and luteinization within the ovary. Vascular endothelial fact, uh, growth factors seem, seem to play a particular critical role uh, in the pathophysiology of uh, uh, OHSS. It, it, it is secreted by the granulosa cell, and its level is correlated with the OHSS severity. So recombinant vascular endothelial growth factor has been shown to induce OHSS, and specific vascular endothelial growth factor antiserum has been shown to reverse the effect of vascular endothelial growth factor induces OHSS. Furthermore, SCG has shown to increase vascular growth factor, uh, endothelial growth factor secretion by granulosa cell and to increase serum level of vascular endothelial growth factor. Indeed, many of the angiogenic factor implicated in the pathophysiology of OHSS probably act either directly or indirectly through the vascular endothelial growth factor. Since OHSS ongoing research will likely to identify anti-angiogenic strategies for prevention and treatment. And as the, we all see here that the vascular endo increment in the vascular endothelial growth factor and its angiogenic activity resulting in increased vascular permeability and fluid extravasation resulting in anasarca ascites and hydrothorax. 
What about uh, what about spontaneous OHS? Sometimes we may face a pregnant lady and she is not receiving any medication. Still, she is presented uh, as a pregnant with uh, with uh, all the signs and symptoms of OHSS. This is what we call spontaneous OHSS, uh, which is occur in a spontaneous pregnancy. So uh, uh, the cause of this OHSS seems to be a familial mutation in the FSH receptor, increasing its sensitivity to, to trophoblast SCG. The mutation allows for consist constitutive stimulation of the FSH receptor, the receptor by SCG, triggering the ovarian cascade responsible for ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. This woman did not have stimulated ovaries. She, they, she didn't receive any medication and did not have SCG triggering, yet she developed OHSS due to endogenous production of SCG by the developing pregnancy. This is spontaneous late onset OHSS is uh, uh, at least one, uh, one report was severe requiring hospitalization and intensive management. So whether FSH receptor mutation or pleomorphism will play a role in the onset or severity of iatrogenic OHSS will require further research. So still the, uh, the um, pleomorphism and uh, mutation may be a cause, additional cause to the uh, uh, added to the uh, causes responsible for the pathogenesis of OHSS. Coming to the classification of uh, OHSS, the classification uh, we uh, we know that the classification is very important and is needed in order uh, in order to manage our patient. It's needed, in fact, uh, for the uh, for the. Uh, diagnosis and even for the management of the patient. We should categorize our patient into mild, moderate, severe, or critical cases. Mild cases presented with bloating, nausea, abdominal distension, ovaries less than 5 cm, moderate presented with vomiting, abdominal pain, ultrasound evidence of ascites, hematocrit more than 41%, white VC count more than 10,000, ovaries more than 5 cm, severe cases presented with massive ascites, hydrothorax, hematocrit more than 45%, white VC count more than 15,000, oliguria, creatinine, creatinine uh, point range from 1 to 0.5 milligram per deciliter, Creatinine clearance more than 50 mL per minute, hepatic dysfunction, anasarca, and ovaries variably enlarged. And in critical cases, tense ascites, hypoxemia, pericardial effusion, hematocrit more than 55% uh, white PC count more than 25,000, oliguria or anuria, creatinine clearance more than 1.5 mg per deciliter, creatinine clearance more, uh, less than 50 mL per minute, renal failure, thromboembolic phenomena, uh, uh, adult respiratory distress, and ovaries variably in love. So as we, we all see that the critical cases, we, we, may, we, we might end it in the death of our, of the, of the, of our patient or the woman. As we see here, that the classification started from Rabu, 1967, then uh, Sinker and Weinstein in 1978, Golan, Ital in 1989, Novat, Ital at 1992, Risk and uh, Abolgar Abu at 1999. There, there, uh, so modulation, uh, different modulation was uh, occur in the classification system. So now, can we prevent, the question is, can we prevent severe OHSS? Can we prevent severe OHSS? We are talking about severe OHSS. The, to start with, the best strategy is to, pre to prevent OHSS is to identify patient at high risk. And this table uh, showing the patient at high risk, those young patients less than 35 year age, Polycystic appearing ovaries, polycystic, uh, a very high risky group for the development of HSS. So once we face a patient, we should diagnose polycystic uh, uh, ovary syndrome carefully at day two of the cycle. We should diagnose early, 
in order to select the best protocol for the polycystic, which we want to mention uh, uh, later on, which is the antagonist protocol, which is the best protocol selected for the polycystic uh, uh, ovary. And uh, 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 then we can continue managing our patient accordingly. Asthenic habitus, high serum estradiol level, multiple simulated follicle, more than 20 for the IRT cycle and more than six for ovary, uh, ovulation induction. Uh, Nicholas sign, pregnancy, pregnancy is also a high risk for the for uh, OHSs and human chorionic UTL supplementation. Sometimes sometime we may, uh, we, uh, may uh, treat uh, the UTL phase uh, deficiency by giving the patient uh, human chorionic trophin, and this uh, uh, considered to be a high risk for the OHSS. Gonadotrophin uh, releasing hormone agonist down regulatory protocol, agonist protocol, whether short protocol or long protocol is considered high risk for the development of OHSS. High serum antimalarian hormone also considered high risk for the development of OHSS and the high level of uh, studies found the uh, studies found that the level of antimalarian hormone of 3.36 nanogram per mole considered above 3.36 nanomole considered high level and the, the, the women with this level having an increase, in, uh, uh, increase at increased risk of development of OHSS. Still, the low risk group, uh, the older, uh, older women more than 32, still there is a risk, still there is a risk, but the low risk. Older, more than 35 years, hypogonadotrophic, heavy build, low serum estradiol, fear, poor response to gonadotrophin, few intrafollicular, elevated baseline FSH, progesterone or no UTL supplementation, clomiphene citrate and or human menopausal gonadotrophin. Many methods was used and many techniques was used to prevent OHSS, unilateral or bilateral follicular aspiration, ovarian diathermy, the using of metformin. Many studies uh, focused on the use of metformin in the prevention of OHSS, and they advocate that the treatment of women, of uh, polycystic, uh, polycystic ovary women with metformin for short duration, four to six weeks, uh, about four to six weeks will decrease the incidence of OHSS. This is not supported by the ESHRI uh, 2019. Suppression of ovarian steroidal secretion, uh, either by continued administration of gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonist following OSI retrieval. This is a, a very um, a important point. We may suppress ovarian steroidal secretion by continual administration of gonadotrophin releasing hormone following oocyte retrieval. Once we, we perform the oocyte retrieval, we may give our patient uh, gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonist for seven days. Cryopreservation, freeze all, is very important in the prevention of OHSS uh, and, uh, suggest, uh, and minimizing the risk of uh, OHSS. Anti-inflammatory action of corticosteroids, not, not proved. Corticosteroid use in conjunction with aspirin or aspirin alone or aspirin with corticosteroid, calcium infusion, all those methods tried. Vascular endothelial growth factor receptor antagonist and treatment with tyrosine kinase, um, also, also tried in uh, 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 some studies. Dopamine agonist also tried uh, uh, it decreased the vascular permeability by preventing phosphorylation of vascular endothelial growth factor receptor to cabergolin tried in the in the in, in order to uh, prevent OHSS and a promising approach of kisleptin, a novel trigger of oocyte maturation for women at high risk of OHSS undergoing IVF is also tried. We uh, and then part things points related to the embryologist liberal uh, uh, application of embryo cryopreservation freeze all is very important. Culture of the embryo up to the blastocyst stage. Uh, this give uh, uh, give the uh, give us a seven days in order to reevaluate our our woman and, uh, and to reassess her if we can. 
uh, transfer for her a fresh frozen, a fresh embryo, or, a fro or we, we freeze the embryo for her to be transferred later on. Improvement in in vitro maturation of immature oocyte. Also, this is uh, that's points related to, to the uh, embryologist. Here, we I want to concentrate more on the role of stimulatory agents and the protocol used. And the, uh, the, uh, the current increasing use of gonadotrophin releasing hormone antagonist in clinical practice hold great promise for preventing severe urgencies. So put in our mind, if, if a patient, if a high risk group, high risk patient, patient with polycystic ovary, gonadotrophin releasing hormone antagonist is the, is the protocol of choice with LH surge, uh, LH surge suppression by gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonist for trigger, uh, triggering ovulation and ovarian stimulation will likely become better controlled and severe OHSS will become a rare if not forgotten entity. So antagonist protocol with the trigger by gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonist with or without freeze all with or without freeze off. Many methods and many types of stimulatory agent was used. And methods of stimulation, for example, chronic ludus, sit, uh, step up protocol, step down protocol, all of these methods used in order to decrease the risk of OHSS. And uh, uh, the, uh, we had a chronic low dose, as uh, uh, Sir Rahim Halud said, that chronic low dose regime is more likely to result in a mono or bifollicular response. And the step down protocol will allow more follicle to undergo atresia, thus reducing the overall number of follicle capable of secreting activity, a secretory activity by the time of HCG administration. Uh, resulting in reduction in the rate of OHSS. One uh, randomized control trial, including 522 predicted high responder, compare mild stimulation with conventional stimulation. They compare a mild, uh, and they found that mild resulted a, a comparable rate of ongoing pregnancy. The stimulation uh, uh, that found that stimulation either in gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonist or gonadotrophin releasing hormone antagonist, comparable rate of uh, ongoing pregnancy within 18 months and resulting in alive birth reported cases. Mild stimulation resulted in significantly lower OHSS rate as compared to conventional ovarian stimulation. So uh, mild stimulation, when we compare it to the conventional stimulation, resulted in significantly lower OHSS rate. Other strategies to reduce the risk of OHSS is cycle cancellation. And cycle cancellation is the most simple and safe strategy, in fact. It's the most simple and safe strategy to, uh, uh, to, uh, um, to uh, reduce the risk of OHSS. In order to avoid cancellation and as an extension to the step down concept, step down concept or low dose concept, costing or controlled drift, uh, and introduced by Sher and, uh, and his colleague, and later practiced widely by several other researchers with variable results. Costing may work to prevent or reduce the severity of OHSS. You can, it can prevent or reduce the severity of OHSS by altering the capacity of the granulosa cell to produce vascular endothelial growth factor and seem to confer this benefit without compromising cycle outcome. Basically, costing consists of withholding. So that what is costing? Withholding gonadotrophin while maintaining gonadotrophin releasing hormone analog. We use costing in the agonist protocol. We use costing in the agonist protocol. So we withhold gonadotrophin 
while maintaining gonadotropin releasing hormone analog administration till serum level drop to the safe level, at which time SCG is given and oocyte retrieval is done. The word is taken from uh, nautical terminology after reaching land under full power or full sail, a boat slowly approaches and follows the coast without any additional effort, taking the advantage of the energy expended previously. يعني شلون البوت من السفينة من تريد ترسى على الشاطئ أول مرة تكون من توصل مسافة قريبة the power will be stopped, will be closed or stopped, and and the and the boat will will reaches the reaches the land. Uh, with the uh, uh, with the energy that is available, so it's the same the same uh, uh, the same uh, protocol. Costing is based on the fact that follicles have different sensitivity to gonadotropin stimulation, and the bigger the follicle, the lower the FSH dependence. And with, uh, withholding gonadotropin administration result in the reduction in the number of a small and medium follicle through the process of apoptosis and atresy. In this way, the granulosa population available to undergo luteinization and liberate vasoactive mediator is reduced, minimizing the risk of OHS. So by stoppage, giving gonadotropin to our patient, the small and medium follicle will regress and uh, and at uh, and will be uh, uh, atresia, uh, uh, regress in its size. And the granulosus population available undergo luteinization, and the vasoactive mediator is reduced, and thereby minimizing the risk of OHSS. So when to start costing? Here we had what we called early costing, costing and late costing. Early costing can be started when ground follicles are of an intermediate size between 12 to 15 milli, and serum E2 level are already above so-called safe limit. Once E2 level drop, controlled ovarian hyperstimulation is restarted. Yeah, early costing had it started at early time. When the size of the uh, of the follicle between 12 to 15 milliliters still needs time to grow, but the E2 level is above the so-called safe limit. This is called early costing. So here we stop giving gonadotropin till E2 drop to the safe level. Then we restart giving our woman gonadotropin and re uh, and continue the IVF cycle. While late costing, the larger follicle uh, here, the larger follicle size, and with the uh, follicle ranging between 16 milliliters and more, and the serum E2 level are extremely elevated. So in, in this, uh, in this uh, late costing, the larger follicle size, the lower its FSH dependence, mature pre-ovulatory follicle tolerate a few days without gonadotropin administration. So this late costing is practiced by most investigators and allow immature follicle to enter atresia while mature follicle progress to age for retrieval to perform the IV and complete the IVF cycle. Okay, different definition for the uh, hyperresponder <clears throat> uh, could be it comes to the investigator agree that, <clears throat> sorry, follicle more than 15 to 20 follicle of 15, uh, 15 million and the E2 level more than the uh, safe level and here, clinical judgment and individual center experience is crucial for to decide for decision making. How is costing performed? Costing performed uh, initially when we find 15 to 20 follicles, 16 million detected by transvaginal ultrasound, and serum E2 level are above the safe limit 
gonadotropin administration is with, withheld. Here, important point is that serum E2 level should be evaluated daily. And after the E2 level drop to the safe level, 5,000 international unit of urinary SCG or 6,500 international unit of recombinant SCG is given. In women receiving gonadotropin releasing hormone antagonist, the uh, gonadotrophy releasing hormone agonist can be used to in order to decrease the uh, and avoid the risk of OHSS. Does costing affect oocyte uh, quality and or endometrial receptivity? Costing procedure and or extremely high E2 level observed in this patient have deleterious effect on gamete quality or uterine receptivity or perhaps both. The harmful effect of high E2 level on anesthetic quality has been consistently shown, but little is known about the effect of costing on oocyte quality and endometrial receptivity. Here, many studies and experience and strategies from different investigators from 1993 to 2004 found there is an excellent pregnancy rate and diminishing the risk of severe OHSS. Vinadifa et al. At, um, um, and to, uh, to, uh, to Torila et, et al., for example, reported a significant reduction in OHSS with uh, costing. And 2003 review of 10 studies showed that less than 2% of women develop OHSS while maintaining acceptable pregnancy rate 36.5% to 63% when costing was continued until serum A2 below the level of 3000 picogram per mole. Abulgar et al. at 2000 found that investigate the effect of reducing HMG dose before costing in 49 women. And he found that reducing HMG dose before costing compared to uh, not reducing HMG dose significantly reduced the duration of costing without influencing pregnancy rate. Uh, and uh, Amani et al. Uh, at 2005 found that costing is an effective approach for prevention of OHSS without adverse effect on OSAT quality and should be applied in case uh, uh, at high risk of developing OHSS. Garcia at uh, 2006 uh, found that it is a good alternative that can avoid cycle cancellation and extremely high responder to chronic ovarian hyperstimulation. What about the duration of costing? It has been reported that a few oocytes are obtained after prolonged costing, but the difference were not significant. However, if, uh, if prolonged, we mean by prolonged costing, prolonged costing more than four days, or some, uh, some studies more they uh, say no, more than three days. However, prolonged costing significantly affected pregnancy and implantation rate. Although pregnancy rate might be inversely correlated with costing duration, a maximal duration of costing in a one study reached uh, up to six days with, um, uh, and they found mature oocyte has been obtained and even fertilized after six days costing. A retrospective analysis by Kovac et al. With gon in which gonadotropin were withheld for an average of 2.2 days showed that pregnancy rate in the costing group were comparable to those of non-costed group. So 2.2, that means that one to three days is a good time for cost and giving, uh, giving good result. Two other recent retrospective studies similarly demonstrate absence of any adverse effect of costing on outcome, uh, uh, cycle outcome, including implantation rate, pregnancy rate, and live birth. In contrast, however, other studies have found either no benefit in costing or has shown diminished oocyte collection rate and implantation and pregnancy rate when costing is prolonged, particularly greater than three days. As I, find, I found a study uh, done by, uh, uh, by Moon at 2008 from South Korea to, uh, in short costing period of one or two days via withholding both gonadotrophin and gonadotrophin-releasing hormone agonist 
can be used successfully to prevent OGSS without compromising IVF outcome. He used this protocol for just one day or two days only. And he found that the fertilization rate, embryo transfer rate, clinical pregnancy rate, and implant, it's all, they all in a, in a proper way and in a good way. Costing withholding gonadotropin, it's a study, a Cochrane study, 2017, uh, on eight randomized controlled trials, seven, 702 women at high risk of developing uh, OHSS found that costing versus no costing, they found that uh, rate of OHSS were lower in the costing group. And costing versus uh, SP follicular aspiration, too few data and of low quality evidence was found uh, uh, whether there was a differences in the two group or not. And costing versus antagonists, for, they found no event of OHSS occurred in either group. Costing versus cabergoline, too few data to determine whether there was differences between the two group. Uh, Ishri guideline recommend that regarding gonadotrophy releasing hormone trigger versus costing plus human chorionic gonadotrophy trigger and evidence a retrospective study including 94 women at high risk of OHSS that uh, in costing group had cycle cancellation because of high risk of developing OHSS. No cases of OHSS occurred in either treatment group. Another retrospective study including 248 women at high risk of OHSS uh, and uh, was reported and the recommendation of the uh, um, uh, ISHRI 2019 that a gonadotrophy releasing hormone agonist trigger for final oocyte maturation with or without freeze all strategy is a preferred over costing strategy in patient of uh, at high risk of OHSS. And finally, most of these discrepancies in the benefit and outcome of costing likely stem from interstudy differences in costing protocol. So the studies is not not not, not uh, unique for uh, over all the world. And additional research is required to evaluate the efficacy of costing and to determine the optimal protocol for delaying HCG administration in high risk women. And each case should be individually counseled to determine whether the patient should be costed and be, her hypothetical risk and benefit should be evaluated. And until multifactorial etiopathogenesis of OHSS is completely understood, absolute prevention will not be possible but costing definitely of a great benefit. So if we are starting against the protocol and we face a patient with OHSS, high risk of OHSS, costing may help. The ISHRI guideline uh, 2009 that for the prevention of OHSS, they recommend a gonadotrophy releasing hormone agonist trigger is recommended for final oocyte maturation in women with the risk of OHSS. Freeze all strategy is recommended to eliminate the risk of late onset OHSS and is applicable in both gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist and antagonist. And if a gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist trigger with the freeze all strategy is not used in patients with the risk of OHSS, it is not clear whether the use of 5,000 international unit HCG trigger or uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist trigger is preferred. The gonadotropin releasing agonist trigger should be followed by luteal phase support with LH activity. And in patients at high risk of OHSS, the use of gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist for final oocyte maturation is probably recommended over OHCG in cases where no fresh transfer is preferred. And gonadotropin releasing hormone agonist trigger for final oocyte maturation with or without freeze all strategy is preferred over costing strategy in patients at risk of OHSS. Cabergolin or albumin as additional prevention measure for OHSS are not recommended when gonadotrophin-releasing hormone agonist 
is used for triggering final oocyte maturation. Freeze all strategy, uh, strategy is recommended to fully eliminate the risk of late onset OHSS and prior to start of ovarian stimulation. This is a very important point that risk assessment for high response group is advised. And thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Basime, for your uh, presentation and your nice lecture. Now we have the time for the questions uh, from the uh, participants. Uh, will be uh, managed by Dr. Ali. Assalamu alaikum, al-Kiram. It is very nice to meet you again, and I'm sorry for not being there yesterday in the Prova. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those nice presentations. So if you allow me, I will start uh, the session of uh, Q&A. Uh, starting, okay, with a question from Dr. Khulud Salami. Uh, the question is for Professor Rahim. Why patients with poor ovarian reserve may have greater advantage considering minimal stimulation protocol compared to other protocols, Professor? Um, I think I think it's not a greater advantage because we know the the outcome. Uh, it could be very poor outcome depending on the uh, um, method of induction of population. But uh, um, uh, th there is no point as you to, to give a huge amount of gonadotrophin to a patient knowing that the patient will produce probably very little uh, uh, or uh, um, uh, few follicles and probably a few eggs retrieved. Uh, and therefore minimal stimulation um, is recommended because then it will be uh, cheaper for the patient and can be repeated. If you look at one slide, which sh sh showed that although the failure rate with the induction of ovulation to produce follicle in poor responder might be higher, but can be repeated. And if you look at the three, uh, three stimulation or three IVF treatment cycle, uh, comparing to one treatment cycle with the full gonadotrophin, you will find that the pregnancy rate in these people with poor responder about 35%. So therefore, if we look at the individual treatment cycle might be probably low pregnancy rate, but if you repeated that uh, uh, over uh, over three cycle of IVF, her the chance of pregnancy will be about thirty five percent, which is very very good outcome. Mm -hmm. And of course, thank you very much. It's cheaper for her for the patient. Okay, well noted. Shukran jazeelan, Doctor. Another question from Doctor Amuna Qasim, and actually we have many questions from Doctor Amuna. Starting with her question about, um, uh, she's asking you, Professor, do you prefer using gonadotrophin on the day of triggering and why? Uh, that, that for me to, to answer or? The, yes, yeah. it's for you. Gonadotrophin on the day of triggering? Yes, she's asking this and why, if yes. Well, no, gonadotrophin, gonadotrophin uh, uh, induction of ovulation can continue until the uh, uh, three days or two days or on. It will never actually interfere with the triggering anyway. Triggering is a final maturation, which has nothing to do with the, with the uh, folliculogenesis. Meaning that if you think that you, your patient will require 10 days uh, uh, gonadotrophin or 12 days gonadotrophin, it doesn't matter. But it, it, you, you go by the measurement of the follicles. And if the measurement of the follicle compatible with the triggering on that day, well, we, 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 we give it. But majority of patients will have the triggering after a day, two, or three. But it doesn't matter if you, if you give it at the same time of the gonadotrophin. It doesn't matter. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, another question from Dr. Amuna uh, regarding the embryo transfer. She is asking, at which day do you prefer and how many days you use uh, progesterone? How many days do you uh, after the embryo transfer or before? 
actually she didn't specify this. Okay, well, well, let let's answer it anyway. With regard to the embryo transfer, of course, that the common knowledge now that we prefer to to go for day five or day day six embryo transfer, depending on the follicular growth. And people now in the UK actually stop. Uh, uh, transferring embryo on day three. Mm -hmm. And even if there is a questionable, uh, questionable quality, they will continue until day four or day five to find out whether the embryo will survive to day five or not. Now, the, there is advantage and disadvantage. The advantage is by day five, <clears throat> if the embryo managed to grow until day five, then the possibility to tell the patient that, okay, you have a high possibility of getting a pregnant. While if the embryo failed to, to reach day five, then we will tell the patient that, well, look, even if we transfer that embryo on day three, okay, mm -hmm. that embryo will be probably not a viable embryo viable, anyway yes. in utero. Mm -hmm. So therefore, although we might actually come uh, out of the IVF treatment cycle with no embryo to be transferred, Okay, inshallah. Okay. I can see him. Yes. Hello. No, I can see him. نعم استاذ وي كان وي كان سي يو اند وي كان هير يو ثانك يو فور كومينج باك ذير از ا بروبلم وذ ذا انترنت ايذر اي بروبلي ات مايت مايت بي ماي انترنت راذر ذان يور انترنت وي ثينك ذات اور انترنت ان ايراك از بيتر ذان يو كي ويل اوكي استاذ كان وي موف تو ذا اذر كويشن بليز اوف كورس يا Uh, it is from uh, Dr. Shayma Abdul Sattar. She is asking: Is uh, oral contraceptive pills before simulation improve outcome? As we know, it decreases pregnancy rate, especially with antagonist protocol. Uh, I think there was a slide in your presentation, Professor, talking about it's oral very contraceptive clear, pills. Yeah, indeed, very true. The slide actually showed very clearly that there is a benefit from oral contraception. Yeah. Hello? Yes, we do. Hello? Sorry. Uh, yes, I can Sorry. hear you. Okay. Uh, I, dis I was disconnected for a few moments. Have you answered the question, Professor? Yeah, yeah. The uh, Thank Dr. Aini, uh, I showed it very clearly uh, on one okay. slide that oral contraception uh, at adjuvant treatment prior to the induction of formulation for IVF, there's a benefit from the, uh, there are few benefits from the down regulation with the, uh, with the oral contraception prior to the IVF treatment cycle. Okay, thank you very much. The uh, other question is from uh, Dr. Amuna Qasim. She is uh, asking, in UK, which protocol you use in normal responders? Right, okay. Well, I, I mentioned again uh, in one slide that depending on the age of the patient, below the age of 40, we actually go for the antagonist protocol. The antagonist, okay. 
at the Antagon protocol. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the, there is advantage of that because of the shorter protocol. And, um, and um, uh, um, I think um, uh, the, the uh, amount of the gonadotrophin in this protocol is lower mm -hmm. than the longer protocol of the, Antag uh, of the agonist protocol. No, oh, and protocol that preferred, yeah. And may I add from my side, uh, is that lower amount uh, decreases the chances of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome? Oh, definitely, definitely, no doubt mm -hmm. about that, because there is no relationship between the uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and the amount of gonadotrophin used, okay. and of course the type of protocol we use. And of course, if there is a question about the um, maybe risk of hyperstimulation in particular patient because of her a uh, because of her uh, uh, BMI because of the polycystic ovary or whatever, then mm -hmm. the uh, the antagonist protocol will be preferred comparing to the to the agonist protocol in order to prevent the uh, ovarian hyperstimulation. Thanks, Professor. Another question from the. Sorry. The cost of the gonadotrophin. The cost of gonadotrophin. Yeah, well, the cost of gonadotrophin. Uh, gonadotrophin in general in in UK is very high. Uh, one ampoule of seventy five unit of uh, um, uh, HMG uh, costs about in the region of about fourteen uh, pound, equivalent to about twenty two dollar. No. It will be covered by the NHS, Yanni, or the NHS, the NHS don't actually cover. The, they cover very limited number of patients. Uh, okay, we have another question uh, from Dr. Mona, Dr. Mona Qasim. Uh, she's asking about PGD, uh, I think pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, is that right? So, do you use it, and what is the indications of using it? Uh, that, that's another lecture. <laughs> yes, I see. I think, it I is think... outside the scope of this lecture. <laughs> yeah, indeed, it is outside the, the the lecture. The PGD, there are actually I know the PGD in the Middle East and uh, in Iraq used for identification of sex, maybe of the baby or whatever of the, or the uh, or the embryo. But we use it for a very limited indication. Now there's a move, actually, it's an international move that mm -hmm. in order to improve the the outcome of the of the uh, um, IVF to treatment cycle, mm -hmm. they use the uh, PGD and they they name it different name. Now in order to make sure that the embryo we are dealing with and transfer to the patient, it's a normal embryo. Um, uh, without actually uh, divulging any information to the patient with regard to whether the baby male or female. But uh, mm -hmm. just to make sure that that embryo to be put in the uterus of that particular patient is a normal embryo. And that's the aim of it. So therefore, in the future, in the near future, we, you will actually find that there will be a lot of PGD to be done for ordinary patient coming for IVF treatment in order to make sure, even without the risk, in order to make sure that the embryo transfer to her uterus will be normal embryo. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, another question uh, is uh, as again from Dr. Amuna. Uh, she's asking ERA uh, testing used in UK, and again, what is the indication? And I'm, I, I'm not sure what is ERA. I, I think she's referring to the uh, endometrial, uh, endometrial quality. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh -huh. this, is actually, this is actually histopathological test. Where mm -hmm. they uh, they uh, they take the uh, the endometrium to evaluate the endometrial receptivity, in order mm -hmm. to improve the pregnancy rate. No, we don't we don't actually use it routinely anywhere. I think in America there is a limited use of ERA. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, a question from Dr. Anival Alwan. 
uh, she's asking, is there a limited numbers of hours between the last uh, uh, GNTH? I mean, I think she means GNRH, given and the trigger uh, injection or the last antagonist dose? No, um, no, no, there's no, no, there's no, no, uh, uh, no limit anywhere. I, I think, I think she's referring to the if you have antagonist protocol or treatment cycle, when we use actually agonist for triggering, and you can you can actually do it the following day or day day two or day three, whatever. It's entirely up to you when to to, to decide to give actually the trigger. There no, there is no limit because the mode of action of the of the two is different. Mm -hmm. Okay, well noted. Thank you. Uh, a general question from Dr. Karim Aziz. He's asking, uh, he's asking about new medical technology without specifying which technology uh, he means. He asks, does new medical technology close the gap of maternal care as a general? Maternal care, uh, in what way? I, 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 um, I can see that uh, the question is very general. I couldn't uh, know what a type of technology he means. So if we, if he can be more specific in his question, please, Dr. retype uh, the question I, again. I'll tell you, uh, Dr. Ali, uh, the technology in the IVF or in, in fact in infertility or ethnic conception is mm -hmm. unbelievable. It's moving very fast. And there are a yes. lot of publication about uh, uh, many new thing, uh, new approach, a new uh, culture medium, a new uh, uh, evaluation of the embryo, and uh, uh, a new approach for the induction of ovulation, and of course the new introduction of new drugs. Of course, we are familiar with the gonadotrophin, uh, uh, HMG, recombinant FSH. Now I mentioned that uh, the long-acting uh, recombinant FSH, which is available in the in the in uh, in America, but not available in Europe yet. I think probably in Europe might be actually very limited, but in UK it's not available. The advantage of that, instead of actually daily injection of the recombinant FSH, you can actually give weekly injection. And uh, the study until now showed that the recombinant FSH daily or recombinant FSH weekly injection comparing to the high purity FSH, they are the same. So therefore, the technology is very moving very, very fast anyway. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. And uh, I move to uh, Doctor Abasima, a question for Doctor Abasima from Doctor Shaima Abdel Sattar. She is asking in early costing, after the decrease of E2 to normal, we continue on the same starting dose of gonadotropin or we decrease it? Uh, this is according, according any, to individualized uh, women. You can uh, uh, order either to return back to, this, to the dose that you will begin with. Um, always, we should, should always start with the uh, low dose gonadotropin in order to avoid uh, OHSS in high school group. So if we start already in a low dose, we can return back to our low dose gonadotropin. And if there is any to decrease the dose, we can decrease the dose by what we call the step down protocol. So this is will and it will be according to each each woman. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Doctora. Uh, and I have the last question for tonight, and uh, it is from uh, Doctora Noor Karim Al Fatlawi. Uh, she is asking, according to your experience, uh, by the way, she didn't specify to whom the question is, uh, antagonist protocol has good results in poor responders. I, I invite uh, both of you to answer the question. Is it uh, uh, for uh, Dr. Rahim uh, presentation or uh, I don't know? Right, well, I can I can answer that actually. With regard to the uh, antagonist protocol for poor responder, no, we don't. For we poor don't responder. actually use the antagonist protocol. Uh huh. Yeah, for poor responder, because because remember that you are you are downregulating very hard, and therefore you have to be very careful when you when you when you use the antagonist. So therefore, uh, um, uh, people actually. Um, 
some time you did, but uh, uh, in general term, uh, to be honest with you, any protocol you can actually recommend it to any patient, okay? But the the advantage of minimal minimal uh, stimulation with the with the clomiphene and letrinol now is more popular, uh, due to the fact that it's cheaper, cheaper and very easy to handle. But whether you use the uh, the antagonist or agonist protocol, it's entirely up to your evaluation. Uh, evaluation by the antrophological count, AMG, and all that kind of thing. And if she had, if she had a problem before uh, uh, with the with the IVF uh, treatment cycle, like uh, cancellation, or 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 uh, number of follicle retrieved might be very low, then you can modify your 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 protocol according to the patient need. And that's very important. That's why. I, I think I think my opinion you should not actually stick to one protocol and uh, unlike the ashri ashri fix the protocol into three category but the problem is sometimes you might actually move that's why they actually put a red and 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 green uh, recommendation and if you find that if you look at that uh, that picture you will find that any protocol, any protocol, uh, whether under uh, higher responder or poor responder or normal responder, you can actually utilize it in another patient, okay? Uh, but you have to modify it. You have to modify the way you induce, you have to modify the amount of gonadotropin you give, but clearly the, the ASHRI don't recommend in poor responder a very high gonadotropin injection. Uh, beyond 300 international units, because there is no benefit from that. So therefore, it's entirely up to you and the patient. And not only that, but you have to consider the BMI, the polystic ovary, whether they're there, and the age of the patient. A lot of a lot of criteria uh, you have to look into in order to make sure that any protocol you utilize will be benefit for that particular patient. So therefore, individualized. Mm -hmm. Individualized, okay. Um, I, I wonder if uh, you, if my professors, all of you, do, do you have uh, uh, more time for more questions or we can uh, conclude the uh, meeting? Um, there are still two more questions in the chat, I found them. Yeah, fine, that's okay. Very quickly. Okay, <laughs> uh, yes, okay. So uh, a question uh, from uh, Dr. Taif Raad. She is asking, which is better for luteal support, HCG or LH? And is there any role of estrogen in luteal support? Ah, right, okay. That's a very good question, actually. <laughs> uh, the luteal, luteal phase support is a very huge subject and it's a very important one. And HCG, we don't actually give luteal phase support with the, with the human coronary gonadotrophy. We don't. We actually use the progesterone. And now the move to, to the uh, to, uh, vaginal, vaginal application or intramuscular application in order in, in addition to that in addition to that we give we give oral uh, uh, oral uh, uh, medication like uh, didrogesterone so it's a combination of two vaginal or 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 intramuscular and oral preparation like didrogesterone uh, 10 milligrams three times daily uh, uh, sorry, 10 milligrams, uh, two to three times daily. Uh, that's a recommendation. Uh, and uh, that's actually a universal recommendation. Uh, but we don't actually give HCG for luteal phase support, no. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. And the last question tonight is uh, from, uh, again, from Dr. Atay Farad to uh, Professor Abasime. Uh, uh, Dr. Ataif is asking, if costing continues for more than three days, what's the consequences? Well, um, studies uh, found that if costing lasting for more than three days, and most of the studies, in fact, study more than four days, they classify their groups into less than four days and more than four days. And they found that the uh, implantation rate and the pregnancy rate slightly decline in the group of more than four days. So they uh, preferable as within one to three days give best result regarding 
the decline mm. OHSS and at the same time preserving the, the uh, in, in pregnancy rate, implantation rate, and live birth rate, and else. Thank you very much. And uh, this is all about the questions. Uh, uh, back to you, professors. Thank you, thank you very much, Ali, Dr. Ali. Thank you very much, uh, Most welcome, and, uh, Most Thank welcome. you very much for, for Kabbalah University. And Manal, thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and have a nice night. شكرا جزيلا لكثره الاعزاء واحب بس انوه للحضور انه ان شاء الله بكره ايضا حيكون السيشن 2 ان شاء الله من الويبينار حيكون عندنا محاضرتين ان شاء الله للدكتور علي النقاش والدكتوره منال ايضا they will talk about also an interesting topic regarding IVF protocols the full story and poor responder in INF نفس اللينك ان شاء الله بنفس التوقيت الساعه بالتسعه نلقاكم غدا ان شاء الله شكرا جزيلا ان شاء الله الله يحفظكم جميعا الجميع Good night. Good night.